All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Council Member Andrew Cohen, Acting Chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Welcome to everybody to today's hearing. Uh, today we will hold hearings uh, on several NYCHA small homes rehab applications, the Hope Homes clusters, and the Lower Concourse North rezoning application. We will be voting on the small homes applications, the Hope Homes applications, and other items. And the other items were laid over from our last meeting. Uh, the first hearing will be on LU 739 through 742, uh, the NYCHA Small Homes Rehab application. In these applications, HPD is seeking a UDAP project approval and property tax exemption for numerous properties in Queens and one in Brooklyn. These applications are located in the districts of Council Members Carnegie, Ulrich, Miller, and Council District 28. Uh, the approval would facilitate the rehabilitation of 24 one to four family homes that would be sold to prices affordable to families making 120% of AMI or less. Uh, I am now opening the hearing on LU 739 through 742, the NYCHA small homes application. Good afternoon. My name is Jordan Press. I'm Executive Director for Development and Planning in HPD's Government Affairs Unit. Land use numbers 739, 740, and 741 consists of 23 single family homes located in Queens Council Districts 27, 28, and 32, and is known as Southeastern Queens Small Homes NYCHA Run Cluster 2. Land use number 739 consists of three NYCHA properties located at 89 24, 168th Street, 210 33, 113th Street, 102 47, 187th Street and one city-owned site located at 110-60 Wood Street in Council District, 27, uh, Council District 27. Land use number 740 consists of 16 NYCHA properties located at 116-02-139th Street, 117-31-135th Street, 129-23-135th Street, 129-41-135th Street, 129-59-135th Street, 130-15-135th Street, 130-16-149th Street, 131-15-Sutter Avenue, 133-16-Vanwick Expressway, 133-18-134th Street, 147-06-Sutter Avenue, 107-34-Princeton Street, 111-14-169th Street, 115-41-147th Street, 150-22-118th Street, 167-08-110th Avenue, and two city-owned properties located at 114-47 Inwood Street and 145-36-111th Avenue in Council District 28. Land use number 741 is located at 103-16 Platwood Avenue in Council District 32. Each night your home was foreclosed upon as a result of a default on a HUD FHA mortgage over 20 years ago. The homes were turned over to NYCHA by HUD to operate as part of their public housing portfolio. Over time, the homes became vacant and are currently in dire need of rehabilitation. NYCHA, with approval from HUD, selected the sponsor to convey the properties to, and each will undergo gut rehabilitation through HPD's Small Homes Rehab Program, which is an affordable home ownership program for one to four family homes. The three city-owned homes will be clustered with the portfolio and all of the homes will be rehabilitated to meet Enterprise Green Community Certification. Upon completion of the work, the sponsor will convey the properties to low uh, to moderate income families earning up to 120% of AMI under program guidelines. The sponsor is committed to conducting marketing outreach events where the homes are located in order to reach as many potential local applicants as possible. And Mr. Chair, did you say uh, we're including land use 742 in this? Round right now. Okay. I'd be happy to include that now uh, before any any questions. So land use number 742 consists of an amendment to a previously approved project located at 580 Lafayette Avenue in Brooklyn Council District 36. On July 5th, 25th, 2012, the City Council approved resolution number 1461, facilitating the transfer and approval of UDAP and Article 11 tax benefits. Uh, under the third-party transfer program's Brooklyn in-rem action number 51. 
Subsequently, on August 8, 2012, the property was conveyed to the sponsor, Neighborhood Restore Housing Development Fund Corporation, for redevelopment. Currently, the sponsor is proposing to transfer title of the property to an affiliated entity known as Restoring Urban Neighborhoods, which will rehabilitate 580 Lafayette Avenue, also under the Small Homes Rehab NYCHA program. Under the amended project, the sponsor will convert the property into three into three family home ownership buildings instead of four family rental as previously approved. Upon completion, the homes will also be marketed to a qualified purchaser earning no more than 120% of AMI in accordance with, uh, with the program. In order to facilitate land use numbers 739, 740, 741, and 742, HPD is before the planning subcommittee uh, seeking disposition approval for 114 to 47 Inwood Street, 145 to 36 11th Avenue, 110 to 60 Wood Street, as well as UDAP tax benefits for all 23 properties, including um, land use number 742. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want just sort of understanding what's happening at large. HUD gave the property to NYCHA. NYCHA is conveying the property to not-for-profits who are going to rehab them. And then through an HPD program, we're going to convey them to eligible purchasers uh, who will apparently up, earn up to 120 percent of AMI. And we're also the authorized entity to, um, to request um, the UDAP tax benefits as well. That's, that's why, correct. Ultimately, that's why we're here for the, the tax benefit as part of the package. And the disposition, yes. And the disposition? Yes. Uh, but NYCHA is the, NYCHA owns the property? The three city-owned the, the three, the three uh, city properties NYCHA okay. owns. Could you, I'm sorry, could you put yeah. your name on there? Uh, Nadja Radcliffe, Nadja Radcliffe, Director of Homeownership Programs and Development at HPD. So 23 of the homes are owned by NYCHA and three are owned by the city? 20 are owned by NYCHA, three are owned by the city. Okay. But there's other 24 ho homes or 23 homes? The TPT. And then, which is also, so it's it's 20 plus 3 plus, plus one. 1. Plus yeah. 1. I know Jordan and may have said all of this, but I'm just, that's, trying, to that's okay. just trying to prove there, that there are I, a lot of or, or disprove that I understood what he was saying. Um, so <laughs> 20 plus 3, three plus and then one. plus an, an additional one, which is coming from the third-party transfer okay. program. Um, do you know what the breakdown is of one family, two family, three family, and four families? Um, I believe these are all, these are all one family? All two family, except for one three family. All twos? Except for the, the last TPT, that'll be a three family. That'll be a three family. Okay. Is that? We're, we're, I'm, we're going to, uh, ask. The sponsor, Sal Devola, to uh, introduce himself and provide clarity. Welcome. As he always can do. Sal Devola, Executive Director of Neighborhood Restore and Restored Homes. Um, we're the nonprofit that's going to take title to these properties. Um, there are the NYCHA houses are all single family, the HPD ones are all single family. The, uh, the third party transfer one at 580 Lafayette is, a, is currently a four family that we're converting to a three family. So 23 ones and one four. Correct. Okay. Which will become a three. Which will become a three. Um, uh, that's good, because anecdotally, I, I have concerns about the uh, people's ability to manage the multifamilies. But I, I guess in this case, that's not really an issue. The, the three family, you'll be make sure, make extra effort to make sure that that ends up in the, the hands of someone who can manage a three family house. Yeah, all of our homeowners will go through homeownership training. They'll all be, they'll all be required to do that before they um, qualify to purchase the homes. And one of the classes that is offered is landlord training for the multifamily properties. Uh, how long is the tax break for? What is the duration of the, duration of the, tax. the tax benefit? 20 years. 20 years. And you, you've explained this at, at hearings before, and maybe I understood, but I'm going to try to understand one more time. If someone, I purchased the home, I'm an eligible, qualified purchaser, I purchased the home, 
at 10 years I decide I want to move, what happens? There will be some level of subsidy. There'd be some level of subsidy that would have to be repaid back to the city. But as far as the tax exemption, it would go to the next owner who resides in the home. The tax exemption is sort of a, you get that benefit in the year you get it, and that just, that just. Uh, it, it'll stay with the property as long as it's owner-occupied. That's the key. It has to be owner-occupied. But what, what, what about the HPD? Well, what, besides the tax benefit, what else is HPD giving these? What else is the subsidy? We provide um, funding for the construction so that we keep the, the house prices low. You're financing the rehabilitation? Yes. A portion of it, yes. Along with private financing. There's a company. There, there's a facility that we have. We will be getting construction financing from a private lender, and there will be there'll also be additional subsidy from HPD in the deal, and we will also be applying for state affordable housing corporation subsidy. Um, each homeowner will have an enforcement note and mortgage that's tied to it when they purchase the home. The enforcement note and mortgage will actually lay out the terms under which the homeowners will be obligated to remain in the properties. And if, in your instance, if someone were to sell the home within 10 years, depending on the enforcement note and mortgage, there may be some – there probably will be some recapture of, of funding that was put into the deal. Um, so the money would come back, and HPD and the state would have to approve – the sale of that property because the enforcement note and mortgage will probably be, I think it's 20 years right. is what the enforcement note and mortgage is. So for the period of 20 years, any refinancing or any sale of that property would have to come back to the City of New York and the City of New York would have to approve that subsequent sale. And it's at that point when they would look at the documents and determine how much would be recaptured in terms of subsidy. Uh, is there any, uh, is, is there a can, this, can the purchaser sell it for any amount that they want to? Is there? The enforcement note and mortgage that we are talking to the city about, and, and we've done one cluster of these houses already. We are actually in the process of completing 19 NYCHA homes. So the assumption is, is that those enforcement notes and mortgages will be the same for the second cluster. Um, there are nuances in the enforcement note and mortgage that are tied to the affordability on the subsequent purchaser. Um, a portion of these homes we are selling at uh, cannot exceed 80% of AMI, and a portion of these homes cannot exceed 120% of AMI. It's a 50-50 split, essentially, in the homes. Um, on subsequent resale of these properties, if one of the homes was sold to someone who was below 80% of AMI, let's say, when they go to sell the home within the recapture period, if they sell it to someone who is also below 80% of AMI, then they are not required to actually repay those subsidies. Those subsidies will transfer to that subsequent homeowner. Uh, if I qualify, it, and do I put money down? I mean, is there... Yes, there's a, it, it's, a, it's a mortgage. Um, I mean, they are, they are uh, affordable housing mortgages. There are lenders that have um, community lending products for this population of people, um, but there will be a requirement of at least 5% down. 5%. But you're going to put the whole package together. Once we identify an eligible purchaser... We will abide by HPD's marketing guidelines. So HPD has a set of marketing guidelines, and they have a plan. We will work out a plan on how we identify purchasers to this home. It will be a lottery. Um, through that lottery, we will then have certain preference categories that are laid out by HPD in the marketing plan. We will then interview all of these purchasers, interested purchasers, and we will qualify them. And then they eventually will have to get a mortgage. And so they will also be underwritten by a lender who's going to look at that to make sure that they can afford that mortgage. Is the lender, though, someone you're going to work with, too, or they could? Yes, we have a pool of lenders that have this community lending product that's available to these purchasers, and so we um, recommend to interested purchasers three or four different lenders to, to talk to about this. So the ultimate price of the home is going to be a function of all of the programs, more so than whatever the market might bear for these homes. These will all be below market. We've been joined by Council Member Traeger. I was going to ask Council Member Traeger if you have any questions. Uh, I know that uh, myself and Council Member Traeger, though, are uh, big fans of programs that ultimately give people an opportunity for home ownership, and that is what we're doing today, so I'm uh, very pleased. 
Uh, so I'm now going to ask if there's members of the public who wish to testify. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask if there's members of the public who wish to testify. Seeing none. All right. I'm now going to close the public hearing on LU 739 through 742, uh, and I'm going to go on to uh, our next hearing, which will be on pre-considered LU, uh, the, home, the Hope Homes Cluster Tax Exemption, tax exemption Application. Uh, in this application, HPD is seeking approval of an amendment to a previously approved tax exemption for several properties in the Speaker's District in Manhattan. The amendment will extend the term of the exemption from 10 years to 20 years. I am now opening the public hearing on the Hope Homes Cluster application. Mr. Press. Thank you. This pre-considered item consists of an amendment to a previously approved project under HPD's Neighborhood Homes Program known as the Hope Homes Cluster. On Hope on June 28, 2001, Resolution Number 1987, the City Council approved the disposition of 14 properties, all within the Borough of Manhattan. Of the 14 buildings, four are in Council District 9 and 10 are in Council District 8. More specifically, the locations are Block 1644, Lot 65, Block 1749, Lot 16, Block 1750, Lots 57 and 58, Block 1751, Lot 50, Block 1783, Lots 109 and 10, 17, Block 1785, Lot 8, Block 1796, Lots 41 and 21, Block 1806, Lots 37 and 111, Block 1807, Lot 113, and Block 1796, Lot 4. The original approval allowed for the redevelopment of the properties into two, three, and four family homes which HPD conveyed on May 13, 2002. Upon rehabilitation, upon completion of the rehabilitation, the sponsor began selling the buildings to home buyers, which occurred between 2004 and 2006. As part of the original project approval, each property received UDAP tax benefits for a period of 10 years, which have now expired. Um, the property, the program also had an owner occupancy requirement. Uh, once that obligation was met, the owner was free to sell the property with few restrictions. It has been brought to HPD's attention that the home buyers were originally given information indicating that the UDAP tax benefits were to be granted only for were to be granted for a period of 20 years rather than 10 years. To date, many owners are still in occupancy and are experiencing hardship due to the implementation of real property taxes, given that the 10-year tax exemption have expired. After very careful consideration. HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking to extend the UDAP tax benefits for an additional 10 years for a total of 20 years under UDAP statute. The exemption will effectively pick up where the original 10-year period ended. It should be noted that under UDAP statutes during the last 10 years of the exemption phase, the benefits will decrease in equal annual amounts of 10% until full taxes are due. Also, as a requirement of HPD's home ownership programs, eligible property owners will be required to document owner occupancy by uh, entering into a regulatory agreement for the duration of the extended tax benefit. Uh, this request has the support of the speaker, Mark Viverito, and Council Member Bill Perkins. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, first, uh, I might as well I'll say something nice about HPD. One you should serve that once in a while, but it does seem that HPD is really a uh, uh, going uh, that extra mile to try to work something out with uh, with people who have, you know, in good faith, entered into this program, purchased these homes, um, whether it was miscommunication or whatever happened, uh, to try to come up with a resolution that uh, is fair and equitable. So I, I do think that HPD deserves uh, a credit for that. Thank you. The um, the statute does allow for 20 years. Um, a little bit unclear as to why it was only done for 10, but. Um, this was the homeowner's expectation, and um, and after again very careful consideration, we believe this is the right thing to do. Uh, I'm just curious. I, I haven't conducted a real estate closing in a long time, but uh, would a, a a title search have re uh, told the owners that they had a 10-year tax exemption versus a 20-year tax exemption? I don't know that it would have been the title search. Um, the 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 ten year exemption was attached to the resolution that the council passed. DOF is then responsible for implementing that tax exemption. Um, 
I think it, it's fair to say that a very diligent attorney on behalf of the purchasers may have caught that. Um, but I, there are, our property tax system is quite arcane in the city, and I can understand how it could have been missed. Yeah, I, I, I can too, I guess. But it, it just it sort of just circles back to my initial concern that it's important that we really offer um, a deep level of support uh, to people who you don't have a tradition of being homeowners of how complicated a transaction that they're entering into. Uh, and, I mean, this is clearly if you thought you had a 20-year tax exemption and you had a 10-year tax exemption that is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that you didn't anticipate, um, it's important that we – and, again, I think HPD really seems to have stepped up to the plate to try to solve the problem. but. But that's, I, again, trying to make sure that people who are purchasing these homes uh, really know what they're purchasing. We will take the praise and leave the room very quickly. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Let's see. Let's get this up and running. All right. I'm going to go back to where I belong here. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do our last hearing today. Uh, we'll be on LU 747 through 750, the Lower Concourse North Rezoning. The application submitted by the New York City Economic Development Corporation seeks approval of a disposi disposition of city-owned property, zoning map uh, amendment, text amendment, and special permit. These approvals would facilitate the development of the site located on the Harlem River just north of the 145th Street Bridge in the Bronx. The proposed development would include over 1,000 units of housing and a mix of retail, office, and community facility uses and a significant amount of publicly accessible open space. The development site is located in the Speaker's District, and she was planning to be here today, but the hurricane and crisis in Puerto Rico have pulled her away. In her absence, she has asked, she's asked me to read a brief statement from the Speaker. At almost five acres, the Lower Concourse North site is one of the few large plots of city-owned land in the South Bronx and has remained undeveloped for over 20 years. So a site of this size requires us to make sure we are doing everything we can to achieve a variety of policy goals. We know that open space has been a key issue for this project from the start. There has been a lot of confusion and miscommunication about the plans for this site, which makes it even more critical that this project deliver high quality, publicly accessible open space for the community, which includes waterfront access and an extension to Mill Pond Park. Affordable housing is another core concern, with 600 units planned for Phase 1 and up to 400 units in Phase 2. We need to ensure that these units will reach, deep level, reach a deep level of affordability, including units at 30% and 40% of AMI, not just for Phase 1, but also in Phase 2. The schools in the adjacent district are overcrowded, and this project will only increase those challenges. So we need to ensure that we are building school seats as we are building housing. There are significant and serious concerns. These are, are all significant and serious concerns, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue to see if we can address these issues in the limited amount of time we have. I am now opening the hearing on LU 747 through 750, the Lower Concourse North Rezoning. If you could guys introduce yourself, please. Good afternoon, Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember Trigger. My name is Cecilia Kushner. I'm a senior vice president of the Economic Development Corporation. I'm joined here by Nick Molinari from the Parks Department. Um, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this very important project. As the speaker mentioned in her uh, remarks, this project is a unique opportunity to develop one of the large, uh, last large vacant prop, uh, vacant sorry, vacant waterfront site owned by the city to deliver on multiple community and city objectives in the South Bronx, namely affordable housing, high quality waterfront open space, and cultural and community amenities. Um, I'm happy to be joined today by the development team that was selected by EDC to develop the site. It's a joint venture partnership between L&M Development Partners and Taipei Project, which is a woman-owned emerging developer. 
The development team and many of their project partners are here today to walk you through the details of the Bronx um, Point project. I don't want to steal their thunder, but I wanted to give some context to the work that the city uh, and EDC in particular has been doing in the neighborhood so you understand uh, how the Bronx Point project fits uh, overall. And before I begin, I also want to thank uh, the speaker staff, George Sarkissian and Rebecca Crimmins, who have been instrumental in helping us coming to, um, to today. So the Bronx Point project is a key component of the Lower Concourse Investment Plan, which is a $194 million infrastructure and open space investment that was announced by the mayor in the 2015 state of the city and which is currently being implemented. To guide and prioritize this $194 million allocation, EDC conducted investigative analysis on the state of existing infrastructure and through interactive workshops and community visioning session, worked closely with local residents in Community Board 1 and 4 in the Bronx um, to identify the following community priorities that are on the slide behind me. <coughs> so the four priorities that the community really drove home for us was um, first, a desire for development of mixed income affordable housing that meets the needs of the people in the surrounding area, but also provides option for moderate and middle income Bronx residents who want to stay in the South Bronx but struggle to find quality housing option. The second goal was a strong desire for more open space, including opportunities to extend the Harlem River Waterfront Greenway. The third one was community facility uses that benefit the local community, including activity for youth and cultural and educational space. And the fourth one was access to jobs and workforce development opportunities. In response to these priorities, the city has committed to a number of projects to use our $194 million allocation, including the acquisition of building of a new waterfront park that will be 2.3 acres, um, that is at 144th Street. This is a park that was mapped parkland during a 2009 city planning rezoning in the area, but it was never funded, and therefore the city never moved forward with actually creating the park. Um, we also um, are working through a full depth reconstruction of exterior street, which is the major street under the Deegan Highway, including new sewers and water line, the redesign of three very large and dangerous intersections at 149th Street, 144th Street, and 138th Street. Um, the Bronx Point project in the Low Concourse North site, which is our third kind of major investment, and finally broadband infrastructure to spur the area potential as a jobs hub. All of these investments are currently on the various stages of advancement, but broadly, um, to update you, um, we aim to complete the street and sewer infrastructure in 2021, um, secure the title for the park uh, at 144th Street by early next year, and open the new park in 2022. Redevelopment of the Lower Concourse, not, uh, con Lower Concourse North site into the Bronx Point redevelopment is critical in realizing this overall vision for the area. Uh, historically, an industrial site, the only remaining freight building that was on the site was demolished in the early 2000s. Since then, the site has remained vacant with this waterfront in disrespair and activity, ac activated only um, with temporary uses. Over time, many ideas for this site were discussed but were never funded, including using it for open space, indoor recreational uses, and even a velodrome during the 2012 Olympic bid. Lower Concourse North is one of the very few remaining vacant city-owned parcel in this neighborhood. Each large site allows the city to deliver on all of the goals that were established through the community process that we held for the last couple of years. Um, so these are the land use actions that are in front of the city council for approval um, to make sure that the site produce um, the best possible design. We've crafted special zoning requirement as part of an extension of a new sub-district in the special Harlem River District, which is to the south of our site. Additional land use action uh, for the project includes disposition authority, a rezoning from an M21 to an R72 with a C25 overlay to allow for mixed use development program, the mapping of MIH, as well as the establishment of a waterfront access plan that guarantees quality waterfront open space. Um, and finally, we're also seeking a special permit to waive requirement for parking spaces for units that are above 80% of AMI to support the affordability goals of the project, as well as in recognition of the transit access of the area and the existing large supplies of parking space uh, directly across from our site. Um, so just to conclude, um, since the mayoral announcement of investment in the Lower Concourse neighborhood, we've been committed to work really closely with the community to make the best of our money and to make sure that the city delivers. Um, 
we, the Bronx Point is a really important project in this endeavor for the city. As part of this process, we've committed to form also a, a dedicated working group that will meet with CB4, local stakeholders, to provide input and make sure that the implementation of both the city's investment as, as well as the Bronx Point project is done, um, is done in, in pure collaboration. Um, so with this site and the broader $194 million investment in the area, um, we believe this improvement will be a source of pride for residents and an opportunity to address long-standing issues through continued engagement. Thank you for your time. Um, I can take any question or can wait for my colleague at Parks to give his remark and then we can take questions together. Yeah, I think I'd prefer the testimony first. Okay. Good afternoon, Council Member Cohen, members of the subcommittee and other members of the City Council. I'm Nick Molinari, Chief of Planning and Neighborhood Development at New York City Parks. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to offer testimony on EDC's project at Lower Concourse North. Parks is committed to expanding waterfront access along the Harlem River and improving open space, and we have many projects that work to accomplish this. Specifically, we've worked to complete Mill Pond Park, refurbished the historic high bridge, and completed a portion of Bridge Park at the bridge's footing. We continue to work towards completion and are also pursuing acquisition of the Putnam Rail Line, which could create an important greenway connection between the Harlem River waterfront and Van Cortlandt Park in areas further to the north. Partnering with Bronx Council for Environmental Quality and New York State Department of State, we completed the Harlem River Brownfield Opportunity Area Report, which outlines a comprehensive vision for the Bronx waterfront of the Harlem River. To the south, we're also working closely with EDC to acquire and develop a 2.3-acre site as a waterfront park at 144th Street. The Lower Concourse North project will help us to achieve our goals of expanding waterfront access and improving public open space along the Harlem River. It will provide substantial, high-quality open space and, and presents an opportunity to provide amenities the community has been requesting and expands towards a more continuous waterfront esplanade. The residential and commercial uses on site will also pr bring more eyes on the neighboring Mill Pond Park, which we found can help make people feel safer. While we believe this project will accomplish many of the city's objectives, we also understand that some members of the community feel that this site is already parkland. I would like to take the time now to address those concerns and review the site's history. In 2006, New York City Parks was assigned jurisdiction of Piers 1 through 5, the area between Major Deegan Exit Ramp 6, uh, Exit 6 Ramp, and the 145th Street Bridge. The mere assignment of those parcels to New York City Parks did not dedicate them as parkland. Although some may associate Pier 5 with y the Yankee Stadium and Gateway Center projects, a commitment to create parkland at Pier 5 was not part of either project. In connection with the new Yankee Stadium, a total of 22.42 acres of parkland was alienated. Replacement parkland, a total of 24.56 acres, was acquired and developed, including Piers 2 and 3, which were mapped as parkland. Piers 4 and 5 are not mapped parkland. Pier 4 was developed as an open space connection with the Gateway Center development to the east of the Major Deegan Expressway. After New York City Parks was assigned Pier 5 property in 2006, the area remained vacant and unimproved. As a sizable vacant site, it was used in part by various entities for construction staging, for a pilot demonstration uh, capturing stormwater runoff, and for occasional circuses and carnivals. Pier 5 has since been transferred to the New York City Department of Small Business Services. As the steward of parkland, Parks is committed to creating and sustaining thriving parks for all New Yorkers. We're avid protectors of this incredible, important, incredibly important resource. Although Pier 5 has been in Parks' portfolio, it is not mapped or otherwise dedicated parkland, and Parks supports EDC's proposal for the site as it delivers new open space and expands waterfront access to the public. I thank you for allowing me to testify before you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Uh, I guess sort of as a predicate matter, you, you, you both mentioned um, uh, the park at 144th Street uh, and that that was uh, the city committed to that in 2009? The city mapped it parkland as part of the Harlem uh, River Special District rezoning that was conducted and led by city planning at the time. So there was a land use action to map it as parkland, but then the city needs to take the action to actually put money in its budget to pay for the acquisition of private property and realize the development and the creation of a new park, which this administration has been doing through our investments in the area. But 
the, but the 2009 commitment is still, we don't we still haven't acquired the, the land. We're no. in the process of acquiring them. We're in the process of going through the eminent domain process for these properties. Uh, it seems like it's taking a long time. 2009 was a long time ago. So n nothing happened between 2009 when it was mapped parklands and the um, and the announcement in the state of the city in 2015 from this administration to fund the acquisition uh, of the private property. So since then, we've moved forward. We've had a, a, an imminent domain public hearing uh, in the winter of 2016. We're now going through the courts and through all the process that is required by the city to actually uh, acquire private property under um, under legislation. And then, and then by uh, early, probably February or March, the courts will actually give the city title for these properties. Uh, is it, are we using eminent domain? The, the per, whoever the entity that owns the property now doesn't want to sell it. There are three different property owners. Uh, it's three different properties. There is a wide variation of willingness to sell and willingness to negotiate with the city. I would say, but all property owners are waiting for the full court process to take action prior to negotiating with the city. So okay. Um. But uh, you think that, that you think the acquisition phase will be completed? Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, like the 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 site was the the free properties were mapped as parkland. Um, so the city needs to go through the process, but the city is very. I'm confident. sorry. But did you say a timeline for the when you think that acquisition will be completed? Sure, sure. So we think we will get title, which allows the city then to kick in like design by early next year, like February or March. We should be able to get title for the free properties. Then we'll work with parks. Yeah. Uh, that's right. If you go through the eminent domain process, it can take a number of years. But once you vest title, you can start improving the property. That's right. And that allows the city to actually spend its funding towards creating the park. Okay. It's. I mean, unfortunately, it still sounds like we're a ways away, though, before people are enjoying a park. Yeah. yeah. A few okay. years away. Okay. Um, I guess also uh, uh, just a concern, you know, not, not exactly in the project, but is... Uh, uh, school capacity. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people are, are concerned. We're, you're talking about a thousand units. Um, where does uh, how does this project fit into the scheme of uh, current capacity? Uh, what do, are you working with SCA in terms of developing additional capacity if needed? Sure. So. Um for, for our projects, uh, in the, um, the final EIS, the environmental review documents, we have a commitment letter for SEA and EDC to monitor the project. That's the way we deal with um, school impacts for projects that will be happening in the future. That allows the city to really, year by year, have a better sense of like when the project will be delivered, how many families are expected in the project, how many school kids are expected in the project, so that the city can be a little bit more granular about the future needs. So that's how we're dealing with our project. Um, but it is true that currently in the sub-district in which our project is located, absent our projects, there is a school need today. Um, so we understand that it doesn't make sense from a planning perspective to plan for future kids if you cannot serve existing kids. Um, so we're working really closely with SCA to try to find um, a, a solution to the existing school needs. I mean, I, just as a, as a Bronx council member, I can tell you that, that we're, there's not enough seats. Um, and and this, the the scale of this project would be of you know real concern to me if there wasn't a, a real a meaningful commitment not just a desire but a sort of a plan to increase capacity mm -hmm. in terms of seats. Understood. Uh, I you know I, I am sort of familiar with the site and uh, it's uh, not that easy to get to. Mm -hmm. How is that gonna How is that ultimately gonna work? Other than uh, as I, I like to get off at 153rd Street and, and then kind of barrel down, down okay. uh, come down the ramp, and then yeah. you go under to the market there. Yeah. I, I guess you could, as you come down, there's a stop sign that there's not much reason to stop it now, but I do. Yeah. Um, because there's, but uh, ultimately, there would be, I guess, traffic there. Is that it? Um, yeah, so, so I think you, you're completely correct that right now, Exterior Street, like under the Major Deegan, really is a barrier um, to pedestrian safety and just to people getting to the waterfront and being able to uh, even enjoy like Mill Pond Park. Um, so, which is why part of like the, uh, a significant investment that is part of a $194 million allocation. This is south, like there's a tennis bubble there. This is south of there? Correct, correct. 
Um, it's you have the tennis bubble, you have um, Mill Pond Park, and then our site is right n uh, next to it, right, right next to the bridge, right next to. So the intersection that is the one that would really lead to our park is the 149th Street intersection. That's a crazy, it's a very very dangerous intersection. Each time our team goes there, we always wonder whether or not we're going to make it across the street. Um, part of the 194 million dollar investment that we're making is a complete redesign of this intersection. So the three major intersections that we're completely redesigning with pedestrian safety and being and readability in mind is 149th Street, 144th Street, which would be right at the entrance of the new park, mm -hmm. um, and which and 144th Street is the only street that goes from the west side of the neighborhood directly into the neighborhood, and 138th Street. Um, so the idea is that people can actually cross these streets safely, get into the other side, where now with Bronx Point and a new park, there is actually a reason for folks to go and, and cross the streets. There'll be very little access from the north though, right? Um, I mean, you'll continue to have, w how north is north? I just, I, north of 149th Street, I don't know how you kind of get over there. Through, oh, y yeah, I mean, there's like a, we're, we're looking at like all of transportation, you're right, that there's, we need to like strike a balance between pedestrian safety and like I'm not traffic flow sure of a major from. right, and so um, whether or not like once you've taken care of 149th, you need other points um, to cross like higher up on 150th and like all the subsequent street is is something we're also looking at. Um, when would those? Uh, traffic improvements uh, be implemented? Sure, so we're in concept design right now and we have a designer that takes about 20 months to work with DOT for like the exact kind of circulation design. The idea is that it's implemented with a brand new intersection by 2021. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what this uh, question means exactly, but I'm going to ask it anyway. A pedestrian circulation impact, uh, a pedestrian circulation impact was identified in your EIS at, to the subway at 149th and Grand Concourse. Can you explain how this is being addressed? I'm not sure that you can understand what that question means. I think but I, I think I do. I'll give okay. it a little best shot too. Um, so in the EIS that we did for the site, there is a pedestrian um, impact. It is mainly due to um, um, uh, a, a residential building that is on 149th Street that is um, putting its garbage out in a way that is blocking pedestrian access to the site, and that is the main reason why we have an impact. So we're working with sanitation to see if through their operation. Is that on the north side of 149th? I think so, yes, yes, yes. So we're working with sanitation to resolve the issue. I guess Hostos has most of the property on the On the side. south, that's right, that's right. Um, I have questions for the developer. Mr. Traeger, do you have any questions for this panel? Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions, and I think the Chair alluded to it before, um, for just, just a, for clarification. So um, a lot of times we go through these actions and uh, the illustrations look pretty cool and uh, things look very nice, uh, but we have to be very upfront and blunt and honest with residents about this and manage expectations. Mm -hmm. So you have not acquired all the properties yet that we're talking about as far as future parks. Is that correct? That's still in the process? Sure. So for the 144th Street Park, which is not part of the actions that are in front of um, City Council for hearing, that's okay. part of context of what the city is doing. Okay. We are in the process for eminent mean, domain, and the city is extremely confident in its ability to be able to get title for the free properties early next year. So forgive me, I'm not. This is not my district, but as I'm trying to understand this, are those parks close or nearby? They're these? three blocks south of our own of our of the Bronx Point site for which we have a hearing today. Okay. All right, so, but to be clear, you haven't yet acquired these properties. We're in the process of acquiring them, correct. All right. I, I wish the eminent domain process was faster, trust me. Okay, I, I hear you. I think there's a couple of those actions in Coney Island as well. That's right. Um, now, uh, with regards to the housing plans mm -hmm. for these sites, mm -hmm. 
think the chair alluded to a number of 1,000 units. Is that correct? Uh, what That's is the maximum capacity for the site, correct. Okay. And is there an AMI breakdown yet? Yes. And the development team that's coming right after they're us? Gonna, they're going to they, Correct. They're gonna we'll be able to that. walk you through, yes. Okay. Um, I also didn't hear anything about um, local hiring. They will do the same. That's going to be. Th that's but what right. is from 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 your perspective, from your end though, what yeah. what can be done from the city's perspective to build capacity now? Sure. Because something that I I'm already dealing with in my district that I, I want to address, I guess, on a more citywide basis, is that whenever these projects come down the pipe, we hear about local hiring, and then the excuse is, well, many residents lack the capacity mm -hmm. to work on local hiring. Yeah, yeah. Since these things are still a year or two or more away. What are we doing now to build capacity at this very moment yeah. to, to help make sure that there is local hiring? No, you're totally right. I mean, you need two things to happen. You need to be development so there are jobs available and so that developers are required to seek kind of local and give equal opportunity to local um, local folks for these jobs. And then local folks on the ground need to actually be ready to take these jobs. Um, there. Um, here, I think like we, and you're exactly right, it's a lot of capital investment that the city is doing. This is a very large project. So we began to work um, building capacity on the ground. We have uh, an organization here that's going to speak jobs first. Um, that's what they're doing is organizing all local non-for-profit that works on um, capital uh, building capacity for local residents to get into job training and be ready when jobs come online. And so they're already beginning to build a network and some capacity locally, so they can talk you through that. Um, the developer that was picked for the um, project as well is working with Bronx Work, which is another local organization that do a lot of capacity building. And so they're fully integrating that thinking into their work. And so you'll have two testimonies coming through that can talk to you in detail about how we seek to do this in this project in this, this neighborhood. Yeah, because we're talking about a significant investment. That's $194 right. million dollars is right. nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, yeah. And we want to make sure that that creates an impact in the, in that, in the local community that yeah. doesn't just ben benefit the uh, development team, but benefits certainly the residents okay. who need help the most. Yeah, it's, it's a key goal of ours here, so we completely agree. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chair, for, for the time. Things that uh, either I thought of or I missed. Uh, one, uh, I just uh, in terms of the, the you said the, the maximum capacity for the site is a thousand units, but it's your intention to phase development. Why is that? To, why are we phasing development? Yes. Because a thousand units is just too large of a project, um, even just to build. Um, so the way we're conceiving of the site here is in two different phases. The large, look, the biggest one will be phase one, which is like a little bit north of 600 units, and then phase two will be uh, the remaining units. Uh, but the project, it's conceived of as, uh, as one project. Correct, yes. Similar levels of affordability, similar. We know, we, we have like details on affordability and programming for phase one because it's the one that's actually gonna happen now. So we can look at like HPD term sheets and fully understand the level of subsidy that's necessary for the city and be very specific and granular around the affordability. Phase two is further in the future. Uh, it needs to be, we'll probably discuss like exact programming and levels of affordability. Like once we know that we are close to completion of phase one, um, by then, HPD may have new term sheets. The market will be different in the area. Um, so the city's goal is for phase two to maximize affordability and maximize the number of units there. And we have a framework um, for affordability, which that at least 50% of the unit be below or at 80%. Um, but we can't be as specific as we can be in phase one. Uh, I would just say, you know, you know but <laughs> you're coming to us and you're asking us to exercise our powers and you don't have the, the de you know, it, it, we're only getting a half-baked cake, I would be somewhat concerned about that, that we would want some greater clarity on what the totality of the project is uh, in phase two. You know, also I'm curious about uh, the project envisions uh, over two, two and a third acres of open space. Uh, who would have jurisdiction over the op open space? Uh, and in light of the time it's taken to develop uh, 144th, what actions could be taken to uh, make sure that the open space uh, in this project gets done, you know, 
early on that the, the community is not waiting sure, sure. another you know, yeah, decade yeah. plus to yeah. get access to So schools. it's very different. On 144th Street, we're actually acquiring private property. Here, this is like a city-owned parcel that we completely own as of right. The um, All of the open space that's associated with the entire project would be delivered at the same time uh, that phase one is delivered. So in order for the development team to get a certificate of occupancy by DOB and to be able to open the building, they will have to have delivered the open space. Um, so the idea is absolutely to make sure that like the open space benefits are realized before or exactly at the same time than the housing benefits because we know this is a really important topic for the community. The developer is building the open space? Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, does the, uh, in terms of scoping what the open space will look like, what, is there a process envisioned that will... In no. There'll be a public process. So there are some renderings, uh, to Councilmember Traeger's uh, question, there were some renderings that were released, so those are conceptual renderings. We're, we will have a public process to see what goes into the open space that's part of the project. Um, the developer also will be contributing uh, maintenance uh, for the open space as well. The developer is yes. going to, to maintain. Is the de developer solely going to maintain, or? They'll be they contributing to parks to maintain. They're going to pay parks to maintain it. Yeah. They're going to pay parks to maintain yes. it. OK. I'm going to let them go unless you were. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to call the next panel. All right, I want you to do this. I don't think you should do this. Jazu Sanchez, Lisa So, Lisa so John Weed, and Rocky Bucano. change presentation. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, City Council, Council members. Thank you, EDC, uh, Parks Department, and also uh, members of the Speaker's Office. My name is Josue Sanchez. I'm with l &M Development Partners, who, uh, in partnership with Type A Projects, make up the development team for uh, Bronx Point. So we're thrilled, we're honored. Um, it is a true privilege to be here to discuss Bronze Point and development uh, at this extraordinary site. It's an incredibly uh, important location, a gateway location for the Bronx, and we look forward to creating a, a development program that really catapults uh, community, community enhancing projects for the area, and particularly uh, the Bronx Harlem River waterfront. So Bronx uh, Point brings together city uh, partners as well as local community stakeholders to really bring about uh, exceptional, engaging uh, open space. We're looking to, to, to bring entertaining uses uh, and education-focused community spaces um, as well as a permanently affordable housing, all while uh, really uh, pushing economic opportunity here and jobs uh, for all. So today you'll hear uh, the, 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 the story of Bronx Point uh, beginning to unfold. Um, you'll hear from the development team, l &M Development Partners and Type A uh, Projects. Uh, you'll also hear from Bronx Works, which is our, our critical uh, uh, community partner who's been serving the Bronx for over 40 years. Um, you'll also hear from Marvel Architects, the landscape architect, who brings over their experience from designing the adjacent Mill Pond Park. Um, and you'll also hear from uh, Universal Hip Hop Museum, which brings uh, along a level of, ex of excitement to the project, even though I think everything's a, a little exciting. Um, so we'll, we'll get started, and, and next you'll hear from uh, John Weed from Bronx Point, whom we support in, in community services programming. Thank you. Um, I'm John Weed, Assistant Executive Director at Bronx Works. And we are proud to be a key member of this team. Um, Bronx Works has been working in the community for over 40 years, and we're already working with l &M on two different projects, which have been very, uh, really excellent. Um, uh, we, we believe that this project will bring important affordable housing, key open space, and job opportunities. And we think the site itself will allow us to expand on our mission. Um, we feed, shelter, teach, and support 
and we will work with uh, the team in order to develop uh, programs for the community. We know that the community is more than just the uh, 1,000 units, so typically what we do is we work with L&M on a project, and then we will open up our services to the residents who live in the complex plus the surrounding uh, community. And it could be youth services, could be senior services, it could be workforce development. We do all three of those types of services, and we've done those with L&M and other projects. Um, so, and we're also very excited to um, be partners with the other uh, exciting community uh, uh, activities that are going to be coming into the, the complex. Um, so once again, we are very proud to be part of this, and we believe it will be a really great um, project. Based on our experience, uh, you know, working with L&M and their team, um, so that's what I had to say. Thank you. Who's next? So next we'll hear from, from uh, Annie Churchill from Taipei Five. Okay, great. Um, so first I wanted to thank the city um, for including a preference for emerging developers in this RFEI. Taipei Projects has been building community and school spaces for the last 15 years. We've built a number of schools in the Bronx. But without this preference, I don't think we'd be sitting at this table despite a long and respected relationship um, with developers. And so um, we're very grateful for this uh, inclusion in the uh, preference in the, in, the, in the RFEI. And respectfully, we believe that the voices of women and minority businesses do impact the response um, responses and ultimately the fabric of our city. So I wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, so it is with great excitement that we too join L&M in responding to this RFEI. We also believe that this site is a real gateway to the Bronx, certainly not the only gateway to the Bronx, but an important one. We think that its location and size demands that this project take its role as a catalyzing force to activate and further transform the Bronx Waterfront and the broader community. And we need to do this with great care and intention. But activation from whom and stemming from what? We believe that the RFEI correctly mandates that this be a neighborhood enhancing project. We believe that that means it needs to be born from and then connect to the existing fabric of the community. And we believe that this happens visually, physically, economically, and culturally. The RFEI further demands that respondents preserve and provide a rare commodity in New York City, open space. It has been a huge priority in our response. We, the RFEI further goes on to uh, demand that we serve a diversity of uses and of income levels. It also requires that this project be, uh, be an economic and jobs driver for the community. And lastly, uh, the RFEI sets forth that this project is both feasible and implementable. Next slide, please. So as Josue says, we're here today to bring you um, Bronx Point. Um, we hope that you find that this response is responsive and respectful to the community that we're being born out of. Um, our project partners will talk in more specificity, but we believe that with this response. We've activated exterior street and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. Can, I, can I ask you to just hold your testimony for one second? Sure. I, I will. Um, but I'm going to call the roll on the preceding land use items sure. uh, because my colleague is chairing another committee meeting. Uh, so I'm going to now ask council to call the roll on land use 738 through 742, LU 746, and pre-considered LU the Hope and Homes Cluster. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Cohen. I vote aye. Councilmember Traeger. Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the measures are recommended for uh, advancement to the full land use committee. Uh, I apologize for interrupting your testimony. Also, could you do, could the whole panel just identify themselves just sure, so we're making sure, sure that we. Yes, I, I did not do that. So I am Annie Tershwell from Type A Projects. I'm Lissa So from Marble Architects. I'm John Weed from Bronx Works. Rocky Buchanan from the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Excellent. Is Lisa So here? That's, that's Lisa. That's me. Oh, that's okay. Me. Okay. Sorry. 
I apologize. Right? Please continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so we believe that this proposal, um, our proposal that Bronx Point activates Exterior Street on the waterfront with uses that enrich the community's access um, both to open space and to the Harlem River, and that we provide spaces for neighborhood residents to commune with each other and with nature. We believe that we've created corridors of access to and through the site, that our site is knitted to the neighborhood physically, and that rather than cutting the site off and turning our back to the neighborhood more broadly, we believe that this project pulls neighborhood citizens down and through our site, down and through to the water. Um, we believe that we've created a roster of cul culturally and environmentally site-specific program that is born out of and for the Bronx, that is born out of and for the river. We believe we've provided a balanced housing program that is family friendly and meets the diversity of needs and income levels. We believe it, we've created pathways to economic development with job creation, job training, and incubation to support local businesses. And I think we've done so with a great partnership of developers and community leaders. So the next slide, um, PDC has already shown, as we can see, it's an incredibly large site, really amazingly situated, um, but dramatically underutilized. <coughs> More of the same. <laughs> so, um, next slide. Um, so again, my partners here are gonna run through um, uh, the specifics of the project, but as mentioned, this site at its potential will provide up to 1,000 units of permanently affordable housing and approximately 150,000 square feet of commercial and community facility space. Our park and open space designers are here today to walk you through this, this space plan, but it will include an extension to Mill Palm Park, a new waterfront esplanade, landscaped and planted open space, a host of community-centric programming areas for kids and adults alike, and all seamlessly integrated into the existing Mill Pond Park. Josue, Josue Sanchez will guide you through our housing plan that includes, um, as we mentioned, approximately 600 units of permanently affordable housing. Um, I'm gonna come back, swing back around and talk to you about our community facility partners and uh, Rocky Vucano, who is the executive director of the Hip Hop Museum, will introduce you to their plans for the long awaited bricks and mortar location of their program um, which will serve Bronx Point, the Bronx, and the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so I hand it over to Lissa So. Hi, yes, again, I'm Lissa So with Marvel Architects. And we had the opportunity 10 years ago to work with Parks and EDC to develop the design for Mill Pond Park. So we're extremely excited about the opportunity to extend Mill Pond Park and really work it into the, de into the development of the lower concourse. Um, so as we started looking at the planning uh, it, when we were doing the competition, uh, we really looked that we wanted to open the site up as much as we could and really make a visu visual and physical connection between the neighborhood and the park all the way to the waterfront. We also wanted to maximize, and we've been talking a lot about open space today, this is a really critical part of this project, and we wanted to maximize that open space and make, make a true seamless connection between Mill Pond and the project. And so th those were priorities as we set forth. And so one of the things that we did in the massing of the building was we, we turned it to the north and opened up the courtyard of the building facing that north and then brought a, a grand stair that allows this open space to really kind of climb up into the building and really make it open to the public. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so as part of the, our um, original project of Mill Pond Park, we, we had a, a lot of community engagement that we went through. We had work sessions and public presentations, uh, and we really heard from the community what they wanted in the park. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Just, just so I understand what I'm looking at. Are these renderings phase one and phase two? Correct. Okay. Yes. So just to be clear, phase one is the building. It's uh, the U-shaped building is phase one, and then the, the, t and the taller space. building. Phase two. Um, so we we had these community work sessions, and so we we understand that that is a very critical um, piece of this, and that we really need to understand what the community wants in this open space, uh, and that we'll have work sessions with the community, and that will really be part of our design process. And so when we go to the next slide, we're really looking at the goals uh, that we set forth at the beginning of this process, but we really understand that 
it will evolve. And as we understand what the community wants, then we will incorporate that into the design. Um, so first and foremost, uh, expanding publicly accessible open space. Um, second, really creating that seamless connection with Mill Pond Park. We don't, we don't really want that there will be a line between what is Mill Pond and, and what is part of this development. Um, there's a, Mill Pond has a continuous uh, walking path. It's, a, it's this bright red path. Um, and we're looking to continue that from the park into the new development and really kind of close the loop on that walking path. There's also active and passive parts of Mill Pond Park and we're looking to bring that in as well. Um, so that there'll be animated active areas but also just green areas um, and landscaped areas. Uh, the, the Esplanade will be a big part of this waterfront development. Um, it would be a critical role in the design. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, Exterior Street is a big piece of this as well, creating a public plaza um, that promotes the safety along ex Exterior Street fronting the building. Um, so really, connection to Mill Pond Park, extending walking paths, the Esplanade, this new grand open stair, a children's playground uh, would be developed, uh, planted seating areas, exterior street, but also publicly accessible restrooms will, will be a part of the program. Um, and all of these things coming together, uh, understanding where they want to be on the site, will be the key to a successful park. Next slide, Sam. Um, and really, we we're looking to create an animated, open public space. The, the, the picture on the right shows this this grand stair that comes down into the landscape and we see that as an opportunity to have uh, public presentations, the public uh, performances. It really becomes an opportunity for that landscape to engage in the building and looking at basically taking the green from the building front to the waterfront. Uh, this is a picture of, of a playground. We're looking to work with the Bronx Children's Museum or a local artist to really develop what that, that playground could be. Um, but really creating an active, lively open space. Um, and in developing our response to the RFEI, we were very um, insistent upon figuring out ways to connect our programming to neighborhood um, in terms uh, um, and, and the natural environment. And so obviously the river is clearly is something that we wanted to key into. And so um, because there's an, a train uh, line that runs um, in the river doesn't allow us access to the water. We partnered with um, two organizations to provide both stewardship of the river and environmental education to the local community. That is City Science, who is a STEM-based program. We're going to hear a testimony from them in a little bit, um, as well as Billion Oyster Project, who's been working in numerous areas throughout the city to um, Re, uh, to reintroduce the oyster population to New York Harbor as a resiliency measure. Um, and as much as that's important from a resiliency measure, really they rely on the community to be stewards of those stations. And so it really ties in both children and adults into caring for the environmental sustainability um, of the neighborhood. One thing the, um, I think that Lissa um, didn't mention is that as part of this process, we will be working um, to um, to revision the waterfront from a sustainability perspective. Actually, we have a slide on that coming up. Um, and so working with these organizations will be part of that process. Um, and we're very excited to be including the Bronx Children's Museum at a minimum and helping us to design the playground space. They, as part of our process, in, um, noted that there is no really active space for, for early children, early childhood children, or children of early childhood age. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, we're excited to, be, to work with them and with parks to collaborate on a playground um, at the site. Um, obviously, we um, also spent a lot of time thinking about how um, this project can serve to activate the waterfront, not just from an open space perspective, but what commercial uses would really bring people down to the water. Um, and so we're excited. Um, to include a movie theater 
um, as part of this project. We're also very excited to include a food incubator as part of this project. Um, one of the first things you'll notice on a beautiful day when you go down to Mill Pond Park is the amount of food that's being consumed. And so we wanted to expand upon sort of the tailgating that's happening um, in the neighborhood already, but work with local food purveyors to provide um, uh, provide both food and jobs to the local community around food and eating. Um, and of course, um, we're, we're incredibly excited um, about uh, the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Thank you, Annie. Uh, my name is Rocky Buchanan. I'm the executive director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum. And uh, we are excited to be part of this uh, Bronx Point project. Uh, we've been searching for a suitable location for the Universal Hip Hop Museum for about four years. Uh, we had some highs and some lows, but it wasn't until I got the call from my, my boy over there, Josue Sanchez from L&M, that the magic actually took place because L&M and Type A truly understood the vision that we had for the museum and how the museum is a sort, a sense of uh, community empowerment. Uh, as you know, hip hop was born in, uh, in the Bronx uh, 44 years ago, it started in the South Bronx by a bunch of teenagers. And it has since become the most popular art form in the entire planet. Uh, and it's a shame that, you know, hip hop hasn't been celebrated and properly documented up until now. And we take on that responsibility. That's part of our mission is to document, archive and celebrate the uh, global history of hip hop. But more importantly, the uh, the role of the Bronx and how the Bronx played a role in making sure that that evolution of hip hop became so popular. Uh, our partners that we have included in this project, uh, we've been working with Microsoft over the, over the past um, uh, uh, year. Uh, we we uh, participated in a uh, inclusive design and visioning session with Microsoft, and we went to four different cities. We went to Los Angeles, we went to Detroit, we went to Atlanta, and obviously uh, we fi uh, finished uh, the uh, design sessions here in New York. And the purpose of those d design sessions was to meet with different people from the community, from teenagers to elderly people, just to get a sense of what the expectations would be for a hip-hop museum and, and what they thought the hip-hop museum should be in terms of the overall experience and how it should engage with community. So we had some, uh, some great insights that came out of those four different sessions from people from different backgrounds from different cities because we believe that the Universal Hip Hop Museum will serve as a great cultural uh, arts uh, destination, a new destination for tourism in, in New York City and, and specifically for, for the Bronx. So we're excited about that. We have uh, uh, partners with uh, uh, Google and we have Sony Music uh, just uh, because uh, obviously uh, the music is gonna be a big component about it, of the museum, but we are also working with local artists uh, from break dances and the graffiti artists, which are important elements uh, of the culture, to make sure that their, their work and their artistic expression is also celebrated. And we also look at the museum as being a source of an opportunity to mentor kids, to get their creativity, to get their innovation skills, and, and to give them an opportunity to express themselves through the museum to find out how they can uh, place their creativity uh, in today's modern society. Rock in here, you see a, a, a preliminary uh, rendering, a night shot for the for the museum and a potential area for for a performance uh, space. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about housing, which is also part of this project. Um, <laughs> so, um, so as as EDC pointed out, uh, phase one is approximately 600 units, uh, studios, ones, twos, three bedroom apartments. Um, obviously, affordable housing is, is is a great need for the city of New York and. From the, from the onset of responding to this RFEI, uh, making these units permanently affordable housing uh, um, was very important to the entire team. So that's what you see here. Um, the, 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 the team is committed to, to providing uh, permanently affordable housing for, for all those units. Um, we're really looking uh, to serve a wide range of incomes um, from 30% to 130% AMI uh, in accordance with, with how EDC mentioned, the city term sheets. So here you see uh, specific breakdowns 
um, the the site uh, in most of the units will be at low income tiers. Um, you also have uh, bands at the moderate and middle income tiers as well. Um, there'll be a, a Many amenities, uh, one, one of the highlights of the amenities is central courtyard uh, landscape area, which we're looking to program uh, for, for, for active use um, in, in, in the central courtyard and also have a, a viewpoint out to Millpond Park. Um, and then just touching on phase two, um, as, as was stated, this site is, is about 1,000 units all in, so a little over 400 units will be uh, including uh, in phase two as well. Design and sustainability, we realize it's, it's a waterfront site, so we, we need to be cognizant of the potential uh, impacts and dangers of, of doing so. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is, is uh, from, the, from the early stages of the project, we're going to remediate the site. So we're looking to enter the, the Brownfield Cleanup Program, which will provide valuable resources to, to fund the project, but also really remediate um, uh, any potential environmental issues with the site. As was stated, the site's been uh, vacant for a very long time, and, and we're looking to, to clean that up. Um, environmental sustainability is very important to us. Uh, we're obviously going to comply with, with city programs such as Enterprise Green Communities. Uh, we're also considering LEED Gold and also, uh, not listed here, but NYSERDA Multifamily Performance Program is also uh, uh, a program that we routinely um, uh, adhere to in our, in our projects. Um, uh, flood mitigation and shoreline resiliency, we're, we're bringing on uh, reputable firms such as Langan Engineering to really make sure that we, that we uh, have our environmental control and engineering controls on the waterfront uh, are, are exceptional. Um, we're not building a cellar here. We're looking to put uh, a, a boiler room in, in, in the roof. And just, these are just some of the examples of the measures that we take to, to make sure that the, that the site is, is safe. And as was stated, uh, through all the programming you see in the site, this is really an active uh, design project. Whether you come in early, go to the food and beverage hall, eat something, go watch a movie, hang out at the museum, maybe catch a, a performance at night, it's really meant to, to move people, get on a bike. I don't know. There's a lot of things to do here, and I hope that you can feel that excitement from, from the programming that we've, that we've uh, tried to design here. Um, economic opportunity, so uh, obviously we, uh, we, we, we thank the city for committing uh, nearly $200 million in infrastructure here. Um, so this project really complements that effort. Um, uh, this site, uh, based on the uses, with, especially with the Hip Hop Museum and, and, and the movie theater as well, um, it, it's really going to be a magnet and, and draw people into the site. Um, and so we, we, we look forward to, to really keep the area buzzing and, and, and keep the, the, the pedestrian traffic in, in the area. Um, the, the food and beverage uh, uh, market, which is really an incubator for, for local uh, entrepreneurs, uh, so we, we're, we're looking to, to, to push that as, as well. And obviously a, a, a site, a project of this magnitude, I think there's, there's going to be over a thousand jobs here, and so we're really excited about that. Um, MWB uh, commitment and local hiring, uh, as uh, you know, we, we, we share the same concerns here. Um, and one of the things that, that, uh, that we've taken in, as lear learning lessons is that we've done um, Essex Crossing, which you're probably familiar with, with EDC. And so we've, we've learned uh, a, a lot in terms of uh, community engagement. We have a dedicated team to, to MWB and local hiring. So we're really uh, looking forward to, to, to mobilize and, and, and really engage the community uh, on, uh, on these issues. So we're looking here to, to target 35% of MWB uh, contracts uh, as we engage the community not only on park design, obviously recruiting, outreach, job fairs will be a, uh, and workforce development will be a part of this uh, uh, project so we can provide jobs uh, to everyone in the community. And we look forward to doing that not only with the community but the city of New York. So I think we've said a lot. Um, uh, we just want to thank you all, and this uh, is really exciting. We, we're thrilled to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I do have some questions. Uh, I guess we'll start back where we started before. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, access to the site, um, uh, have you had any input or are you working with DOT at least on what you think the a design uh, for 149th in particular, I guess, uh, is makes sense to you that it, everybody's working 
hand in glove to make sure that there's safe and I, I think access is you know fundamentally important to the success of this site so well I think yeah Josue went back to the massing diagram um, the way that we've sort of delineated between phase one and phase two is to create pathways through the site as you pointed out you don't want people to have to go too far north or south to be able to access the waterfront or the open space so it's an important to realize that this was a response to an RFEI and so we uh, are we have not yet started the dialogue with DOT, um, but as stated, there will be a task force um, in addition to our work with DOT through Chairman Viverito's office, and so um, that's one of the first things we're gonna dig into, but um, we have not yet formally been awarded the site, but that is certainly a huge priority of ours, getting people to and through. Um, I also, uh, <laughs> Not that I'm criticizing parks, but uh, the fact that the development of the open space is uh, is uh, is on is on your plate, um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I, I also think that it, it's you know fundamental that there's delivery on on the open space in a you know <laughs> in a, in a timely fashion. I mean, uh, the example of One Forty Fourth Street is not unusual unfortunately in New York City in terms of development of parks um. yeah I think I think that's a that's a that's a great point I'm trying to find yeah so so I, I think was 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 very important to, to echo is that um, we, we we won't be allowed to TCO the building and have people move in without development of the open space so um, so that, that that that's key no, no one wants to build the building and have the open space lag behind uh, these these uh, the development in its entirety will be uh, moving forward simultaneously. Phase one is not just the building, phase one is also the esplanade and the open space. And I would say, uh, also say that this, it, we're not doing it uh, solely on our own. Um, there will be several ap approval steps along the way, uh, working with the task force and uh, task force and community uh, stakeholders. There's also a public design commission uh, uh, as part of approval as part of this process. So even though uh, I don't, I don't feel like this is our, our, the development team's uh, uh, effort. It's really a collective effort, and, and there's various parts, both public and private, involved. Uh, well, I, I look forward to watching it and explaining <laughs> to Parks that look how quickly Parks can be developed. Um, I have a question about Phase Two, but I guess as a predicate, because I, 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 I guess I don't know, concerned is the right word, but um, do you have the capacity to, if this was a single project, do you have the capacity to, to develop Phase One and Phase Two simultaneously? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, the, the, the issue, I, th I think w one of the struggles we're having is, is, is one of the things we mentioned, one of our objectives is for it to be feasible and implementable. And so I think, I think there's some, as EDC mentioned, there's some concern about putting on uh, uh, th th those number of units at, at, in, in one shot. Uh, and also, uh, this project will, will will do a lot of uh, will impact the area greatly, and it, it'll be I think it'll be um, beneficial to see the impacts of the development and what what could potentially benefit the the project or the community more uh, as phase one uh, unfolds. Uh, and also, in terms of financing, it's it's. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's quite an investment it's just, it's a, it's about 300 million dollars of, of an investment and so i think um just just based on the the scope that phase 1 already has and the financial resources and effort um uh for phase 1 and the learning lessons that we'll take from that i, I think uh it, it'll it'll benefit the community going forward i would add just one other thing which is that because the open space activation is so critical it's not just building 600 units of affordable housing Building an esplanade and the waterfront is a very large endeavor, and I think um, we're glad that the city has prioritized that as part of the first phase, but we'll certainly add a complication to the project that is commensurate with a phase delivery. I guess, uh, I, I mean, like you said, uh, the project could have a significant impact on the community, and I think that we want to lock in phase two, that phase two is consistent with phase one. I, I think that there, you know, there are deep levels of affordability in phase one, uh, you know, diverse affordability, but 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 also deep affordability, um, and I guess we just want to make sure that that 
the character of phase two is consistent with the character of phase one, and there might be, you know, again, we're all at the table right now. There's an argument, I think, for making, you know, locking it all up, but um, maybe between now and this project's approval, that will happen. I don't know. Um, uh, this is sort of a technical question, but I guess uh, phase two could conceivably be 400 feet, and you're proposing it uh, for uh, 320, uh, 320 feet. Um, is there any reason, like, why that that gap should be preserved? Should we, as part of this application, should we cap the height at 320? I mean, I I, I just think it, it um, uh, given. Given the timing of, of phase two, uh, I think it, it'll it'll benefit to have that flexibility. Um, so I, I think we could look at look at the site and see if, if there's if there's a, the footprint of phase two. Obviously, is not nearly the the, 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 the size of phase one, and so it would it would be good to maintain that flexibility to to incorporate additional uses if if, if need to. So uh, whether that be additional community facility uses or, or other uh, uses that, that really engage the, the community, I think having that flexibility um, uh, would 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 benefit. Yeah. I guess I would just say as you know advice for whoever wants my advice. But I, I think that that ambiguity is always is a double edged sword for you guys. Uh, it's it, Oh, I'm just going to say this on there. All the units uh, in phase one and phase two, there's 100% affordability in this project, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I don't, is there any thought to in the design uh, about uh, noise and sound? I mean, you have the Major Deegan, I guess, to the east, and I don't know how active the rail is to the west, but there's well, rail to the west. And yeah, I think if the west is uh, for garbage, and it happens two trains a night in the middle of the night, um, and so part of the awesome. reason, yeah, it's great. Um, part of the reason we designed a U-shaped building to begin with, I think, was to, um, in a way, shelter as many units as we could from the Deegan. Um, but we will certainly need to employ, um, you know, a curtain wall or not curtain wall facade uh, design to mitigate noise and impact on the residential units for sure. And it's also part of the reason we raised the building up so high. Part of the reason our podium includes so much um, commercial and community facility space is that we wanted to bring units above the line of the Deegan. So that was one of the first measures at this early stage um, to try and mitigate the impact of the highway on our residences. I would also say that com coming out of re rezoning, uh, I believe we'll have e-designations on the site. And so uh, whether or not we have, for example, noise is, 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 a, is, a, is a common one but we would incorporate uh, uh, consultants to help us mitigate any any uh, noise concerns. So we've worked a lot with, for example, Cerami Associates, who, who's done a lot of work in the city. And so obviously, not only what's going on in the area, but also our uses, uh, the museum, the theater. So we'd be looking to to uh, to retain uh, those those professionals to, to help us there. Uh, again, I, I wonder if, you know, the, and uh, if the U design, I mean, there's a there's a quality of life difference between the unit that faces the Deegan versus the unit that faces the Harlem River. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, sort of the the pluses and the minuses of the site, if there's any way to sort of make that more equitable. I don't I don't know the answer to that, but I would again uh, I would much prefer I think to be on the <laughs> looking out at the river and uh, and the and uh, then looking out at the Deegan. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, again, I don't know how that would uh, play itself out. Uh, you have a contract with a movie theater? We're, we're, we're discussing, uh, we're considering several operators. There's one that we're uh, closer to, to, to getting there. We don't have a contract yet, but uh, the, there's been extensive uh, conversations with, with a movie, movie operator for the space. You're, you're telling us you're very confident you can deliver a movie theater operator ultimately. <laughs> yeah, a absolutely. I think if you look at the Bronx, there's there's not a lot of movie there's theaters out there. Uh, I used to go to Whitestone. That's closed down. Uh, yeah, Bay Plaza. Um, so there's d d given the, 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 the lack of supply, the movie theater operators are, are certainly uh, interested in, in, in opening the space there. Well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, in terms of the the, the not-for-profit space, how's that going to work, and how 
how are we going to make sure that the, the hip hop museum is viable and has a deal that they can got to look out for the hip hop museum? How is that going to work? Um, so we we've, we've we've talked I don't know maybe a year, <laughs> we, uh, and so we 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 have uh, a, an agreement if you will to to to, to get there. Um, we're obviously you you agree well, to agree. Well, <laughs> Um, where we're we're obviously making a lot of public representations. Our reputation is very important, and so uh, uh, you know we work with a lot of nonprofits, to, such as Bronx Works, uh, in years past. So I, I think, and we continue to do so. So we're we're, we're we've we've had those conversations. We we have a, a form of agreement, uh, and so um, we'll we're 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 getting there. I would also add that we're. Um, looking at adding layers of subsidy into the creation of their box and so we don't expect them to do it alone um, that we're going to help uh, assign and attribute subsidy to their foreign shell and then just a quick clarification on the affordable housing for phase two where that's still to be determined so uh, i know edc and, and the city and local stakeholders have been uh discussing that um so um, the the fifty percent of the units will be available for incomes uh, at eighty percent AMI or below, and then above that, it's uh, above that fifty percent is to be determined. So you're saying there could be units that are are, are not regulated in phase two. I, I think that's a still yeah still a con that's still, a, still a conversation between between uh, the city city, of, city partners. Okay. Yeah. Conversation to continue. Um, uh, does Bronx Works have, will, the, will you have space in the facility ultimately? Yes, we haven't um, really discussed what, because we've done a lot of different projects with um, LNM. We've done workforce development, we do senior work, we do youth programming. And generally, um, we've gone into their locations, we've uh, funded programs through them, through DYCD, through other foundations. So it's, It'll be, you know, I mean, we've got a lot of time to plan this, but we fully expect to be there providing social services in, in some capacity. Could you just uh, briefly talk about uh, uh, local hiring in terms of construction? Sure. I mean, uh, it's, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's part of our uh, uh, agreement uh, with, with the city to provide local hiring and compliance with the Hire NYC program. Um, we, we have a, a history of, 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 of uh, local hiring and MWB commitments. Uh, last year, we were awarded over $35 million in MWB contracts, over 120 uh, 20 of those. Um, since 2014, uh, within the New York, New Jersey area, we've, we've hired over 350 uh, people. Um, we've worked with local uh, organizations such as Building Skills New York, um, the Osborne Pro uh, Association as well. And so we look forward, uh, we have a history of partnering up with local organizations for, for local hiring. It's in our agreement with, the, with, uh, with ADC, and we look forward to working with, with the local community members, the speaker's office, and, and to, to make sure we, we, we hit the goals. Uh, you know, whether it's perception or reality, I don't know, but uh, but Bronxites and, and the Bronx elected officials, I think, have a perception uh, that uh, other projects have not delivered on local hiring. So it really, it's important not only that you do it, but I think that you demonstrate that you're doing it in a way that's very visible, that people really can tangibly see that that commitment is being met and that, you know, that it's mm -hmm. your neighbor who's getting these jobs that... Uh, because again, uh, whether uh, whether it's reality or not, the perception is that we've that that people come, they shake your hand, they say they're going to do something, and then it's either hard to verify or, but it's important to us. And I, I, you know, on behalf of you know my Bronx colleagues, I know it's particularly important to us that we see that 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 in a tangible way that that commitment is fulfilled. All right, I don't have any more questions for this panel. Thank you. Uh, Joyce, I don't know if it's Hoagie or Hoggy. Hoagie, Joyce Hoagie. You're a panel of one.
Ms. Hogan, because just because the hour is getting late, I'm going to put the panels on uh, in four I minutes. Okay. Brief. If I we could put everybody on four minute clock, <laughs> that would be great. You know, my late husband had a saying when the kids were trying to convince us to do something, you know, don't dazzle me with the fancy footwork. <laughs> uh, that said, I just have a couple of, couple of statements. So could you state your name for the record? Joyce Hoagie, H-O-G-I. Sounds like the sandwich, spelled a little differently. <laughs> um, I've lived in the community for 40 years or so. I'm the president of the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, BCEQ. So we're very committed to the environment. The Bronx, South Bronx specifically, has one of the worst air qualities in the nation. No one is addressing how we're going to mitigate that. We think being able to mitigate that involves parkland and trees. Um, Pier 5 was promised to the community as parkland. The city has refused to fund it. Um, the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality and the Harlem River Working Group have, they've commissioned a couple of studies and we've had, you know, presented great plans for parkland with trees and different ways of, of dealing with the, uh, the air quality in, in the area. That said, no other sites have been considered for housing. We have taken free public land, giving it to a developer, and now we're gonna go across the street and buy private land to create a park. It doesn't seem very cost efficient. And does that 200 million or whatever the figure is does that include the purchase and relocating of those businesses? It's just food for thought. We don't think it's a good deal. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Uh, John Taylor, I think that's Falcone. David Dishy, Jill Crawford, I'm doing everybody? One large panel. Paul Phillips and John Howard. Okay. Is that on mass? Council? Yes. Everybody all how are you? I know everyone's going to be brief, but just because the hour is getting late, everybody's on a four-minute clock, and if, if everybody could identify themselves before they, their testimony. You seem ready to go. <laughs> and I am John Tyler Falcone. Uh, I'm the uh, Senior Associate of Workforce and Economic Development with Jobs First NYC. Good afternoon, Councilmember Cohen and other distinguished members of the Council's Land Use Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. My name is JT Falcone. I'm the Senior Associate of Workforce and Economic Development at Jobs First NYC, a policy to practice intermediary working to improve the workforce development system and ensure that all New Yorkers are in a position to access and climb the economic ladder of New York City's labor market. For 10 years, Jobs First NYC has been working with local communities and citywide developing and supporting collaborative and innovative strategies to find effective solutions to support out of school, out of work, young New Yorkers. We're here today to lift up one such strategy, the Lower East Side Employment Network, the lesson that has for the last eight years worked to serve the needs of residents of the Lower East Side while that neighborhood has seen a swell of economic development activity. The coalition of eight nonprofit agencies came together in partnership with their local community board, which is CB3, 
in a neighborhood-wide effort to ensure that local residents were appropriately trained and positioned to benefit from those opportunities as they arose, so the local hire topic that we've heard come up a few times here. By agreeing to collaborate rather than compete, these eight nonprofits have improved their engagement of local employers and developers to the benefits of residents of the Lower East Side. With CB3 as a partner, Lesson is able to leverage this strong relationship to negotiate with incoming employers. Further, because employers have a clear access point for local talent, they know who to reach out to when they need candidates, and the nonprofits, by pooling their resources, can offer a broader range of training options and ready a larger talent pool. Thus, the network collectively fills a greater percentage of job openings than a single agency would exclusively fill on its own and maintain deeper relationships with a larger array of employers. All parties benefit from the employer-facing network model. The Lesson Partners have engaged 173 businesses as of June 2017, and they've achieved a 3 to 1 interview to hire ratio, reducing costs associated with referring and interviewing excess candidates to employers. What's more, incoming businesses give Lesson Partners lead time based on projected jobs, and because of this advance notice, they're able to build out customized programs for residents to ensure that they're skilled and credentialed in what employers need, expanding employment access for local community residents. As testimony to the value businesses see in the lesson, they have taken a notable step of signing MOUs designating a 30% local hire expectation at Essex Crossings, a new large-scale development project in the Lower East Side. Given the contextual similarities between the Essex co Crossing development work and the lower concourse work on the agenda today, uh, the NYC Economic Development Corporation approached Jobs First NYC early last year to discuss the possibility of developing a similar employer-facing network in the lower concourse. Since that time, we've worked to gauge the local workforce community's interest in exploring an employer-facing network model and found them to be receptive, particularly given lesson success. Based on our firsthand experience working with Lesson, the opportunity to develop a similar model to serve the lower concourse would help the community to better prepare to serve not only public development activities, but the private development that is sure to follow. By facilitating direct connections between existing residents and new businesses, an employer-facing network can help to ensure that the improvements to the neighborhood are good for all New Yorkers, particularly those that call the surrounding neighborhoods home. Thank you for your time. So uh, my name is Paul Phillips. I'm the district manager for Community Board 4. And our board voted in favor uh, for this project in May uh, with a number of conditions, uh, many of which have already been discussed here. The first one that I wanted to talk about was employment opportunities. And you stole a little bit of my thunder. But uh, <laughs> we are excited to hear about lesson. But I do want to emphasize the importance for us that the jobs before, during, and after construction that they go to local people, both in Community District 4, but also in the Bronx. It's really, really important for us. This is a great opportunity to leverage a publicly owned site, a city owned site for the people of the Bronx. So that's really important. Uh, we are excited to uh, work with uh, Jobs First, as well as EDC, in creating a model for lesson. Uh, so that's really important for us. Uh, the other thing that I want to touch on is the schools piece, and I know we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, there is already a need for school seats without this project, both in elementary and I believe in secondary school seats. Uh, and as someone from EDC alluded to, there is a letter for commitment to monitor this process. But I have to be very frank that we feel very strongly that the city should commit to not just monitoring the process, they should identify a site and put funding toward it. Today, in SCA's capital plan, there is a need for seats in this subdistrict as well as an adjacent subdistrict. So, and this is without this project and also without the Jerome Avenue project, which is not part of the hearing today, but is north of this project and also in my district. Uh, so we feel very strongly that uh, the city should commit to that, they should commit to a site and provide funding. We've given examples of several different sites, which are in the broader catchment area, which could be used. I should note that a lot of those sites are owned by the city, although they are tied up uh, in a, an agreement for Bronx Park and Development, but they are city-owned sites, they are woefully underutilized, and they are a public resource. Um, Lastly, or the last two things are just on the transportation piece. So I know that there are going to be major improvements to the intersections. Uh, one of the things that will not be provided as part of this project will be parking. Most of the parking uh, will not be required pursuant to zoning. Uh, what I will say is that uh, perception is not reality. Uh, the numbers that indicate that there are not a lot of cars or drivers in the district is woefully untrue. Uh, so what I would ask is that we look at some creative ways to 
provide some parking for uh, new residents that come in here. Uh, the, it, there is capacity in the adjacent Gateway Center uh, in their development, but the issue with that is that it's all about price. And so uh, if there's a way for the city to think about being creatively and thinking outside the box to provide at some level um, some affordable parking for the people in the district, um, that would go a long way. And then the last piece in that is in terms of transportation. Uh, we're looking at improving the intersections, but I have to say we're excited about this project. But when you talk about additional users, a thousand units, the Hip Hop Museum, all of those uses coming to that intersection in an area that is already seeing tremendous amounts of development. I went to a groundbreaking last week for another 265 units just north of this site. So we're busting at the seams. So all of that is to say that we need to have investments in infrastructure as well as to as well as investments in affordable housing. They're extremely, extremely important. Uh, and then lastly, what I will say is that we are uh, very much committed to creating a steering slash um, governing committee for this project. We're very interested and excited to work with EDC and with other partners. We think it's a really important component for all of us within the community to monitor that site, but also to be in engaged in the community engagement piece of that. And then lastly, I just want to thank uh, EDC, specifically uh, Kate Van Tassel, Charlie Samboy, uh, Elijah Hutchinson, as well as Cecilia Kushner for their partnership and their collaboration and their willingness to work with us. And we're very excited. And on behalf of Community Board 4, we look forward to working with everyone on this project. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Press the button. You couldn't hear me before, right? Uh, <laughs> well, here's the concern I have, and I, I'm grateful to. I'm sorry, could you just re identify yourself? Sure. John Howard Algaring. I am the chairperson of the Parks and Recreations Committee for Community Board 4. Now, my focus or the focus of my statements will have to be with the development and a long term view towards not ending up with staccato waterfront access for green spaces. We have a great uh, traveling walkway or bike path that ends at the new high bridge. Uh, we have a beautiful bike path that begins on the northern side of Mill Pond Park and winds through the park and goes nowhere. I hear commentary coming from uh, the developers in the group that they will create a loop on that walk path that will kind of turn back on itself and then we're going to have another park at 144th Street and my concern is that and my overarching uh, vision for that entire waterfront is that we have one contiguous waterfront access uh, travel way uh, akin to what they have in the well, the majority of Manhattan that would allow people to enjoy the green spaces that you're developing. It makes no sense to have a new park on 144th Street if the access is just 144th Street and no one from the surrounding areas will find themselves in a fluid pathway that leads to that location. So I'd like to see the development include concepts with parkway that or parkway pathways that continue to the southernmost tip of the Bronx Peninsula where we know that new development is coming. Um, we're grateful to see the activation of the parkland and we look forward to actually gaining more acreage for use by the community. Uh, but in addition to all things that have been said and promised, and it's particularly what our district manager, Mr. Phillips, said, you know, keep that in mind. And we'd like to see some projected depictions that show, you know, the waterfront park access travel thoroughfare uh, with a mind towards its continuing south and continuing north with the hurdles that come with some of the landowners that to the north and to the south uh, dealt with uh, in future uh, sessions. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Jill Crawford from Type A Projects and my colleague David Dishy from L&M. We, we are meant to read statements from City Science and the Billion Oyster Project. I think in the interest of time, we'll submit those. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your testimony, everybody. We're done with panels. All right. I'm going to go back to the script.
All right, so I will now close the public hearing on LU 747 through 750. We will be laying over these items until our next hearing. I'd like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Gavel.